to do a little bit of that. Fantastic. Okay. I say fantastic a lot. I think this is a new thing that I've been adopting. Let's welcome our first speaker, Keith. When I first asked Keith to speak, he said, seven minutes, that's not enough. And I was like, you can have your own half-day session if you want. Um, but I'm very happy that he's here sharing about himself and not just his industry. Uh, he works in gamification and does a lot of work with corporations, helping them to, to motivate their employees or their customers. So a round of applause to Keith. Yeah. So uh, just a quick like fun fact. That was actually that photo was taken by Angela, right? About two years back. I think we should do a new one very soon. Yeah. So uh, thanks for coming for my coming out party over here, right? Despite this being the first day of a uh, uh, Hungry Ghost Festival, right? And uh, I was actually really nervous giving this talk, and uh, my heart is pumping incredibly fast right now. I've never really spoken about myself, right? It's usually about gamification. Okay. It's usually about gamification. And uh, usually about uh, other, other people, right? So it's very rarely I get to talk about myself and let alone my failures. So I uh, hope you enjoy this talk. And uh, if you are looking to walk away feeling motivated and inspired, right? Uh, I suggest you go to our toilet break right now, right? Uh, you're probably going to leave this place very demotivated, very dis despised, right? But I uh, hope you enjoy this talk. So uh, this is my topic for today, right? Uh, five ways to fuck like a boss. So uh, one good outcome of this, preparing for this talk was that uh, when I do a Google search of Keith Ng and fuck up, right, I come right in the first page. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, right? And uh, I think I had a blackout from the year of 2011 all the way to 2014, right? I can't remember much of what happened. So thanks to Angela who kind of got me to do up these slides, I was slowly exploring my membranes and I remember a lot of things. So I hope you guys would uh, learn from my mistakes. And uh, before I go on, I just want to talk a little bit about the lowest points in my life. So let's start off with this, right? Have any one of you taken a credit card loan over here? Okay, we have one, right? Uh, so I don't think you took more than one, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, so I took about three loans, uh, OCBC, Standard Chartered Bank, Citibank, right? And I found that OCBC has the best rates. You know, best <laughs> trans transfer balance rates, right? So, you know, I could have started a business comparing credit card loans, right? And I could make a very good money. But uh, I was taking a lot of loans basically to pay off my guys, right? And uh, I strongly recommend you not to do that, right? It's incredibly unhealthy, incredibly stressful, and the interest rate was just compounding year on year. And uh, I know we have one person with a bank balance of $1. Yeah, anyone else over here at one point in your life? Right. Also extremely unhealthy, yeah. But uh, I was actually at this point of time, you know, I kind of got played out by an investor who's supposed to fulfill the second tranche of the investment. Uh, he's an American, uh, he's a multi-millionaire, and uh, you wouldn't expect him to default on the investment sum that's about 30K that is being matched by the NRF for another 200,000, right? You wouldn't expect that someone who's a multi-millionaire, but he's gone a little bit mentally unstable, right? And he went bankrupt himself. So there's nothing I could do. And uh, at this point of time, I was doing a lot of research on Google, the easiest way to commit suicide, right? And uh, by the way, I found that there's no easy way. Every single way is painful, and the odds are against you, right? Only one out of 33 people managed to successfully commit suicide. So don't even think about that. Yeah. And uh, electricity cut off, utilities cut off. Anybody? Right, so I had a hat trick of like three lowest points in my life, and this is what I call my defining moment, right? Because if you look at the other two lowest points, they were all over a phase of time. But this was a defining moment. It happened right away. And when that happened, because we couldn't pay up the bills, and that was about 2012, 2013. So uh, my next five slides is about how to avoid situations like that. Right? So uh, I think I'm a huge fan of like uh, dreaming, you know, working for a passion, working for your, you know, what you love, what you believe in, quitting your job. But uh, I think it's very important that you wake up from your dream, right? And uh, dreams can be powerful, but they can also be very dangerous. They have made me struggle for four years, right, in the B2C business. And uh, when we finally decided to pivot to uh, B2B in 2014, right, or 2012, right, uh, that was when we started making real money. And that's a very gratifying moment, right? So please wake up and dream. And, uh, you know, 
we are crazy about publicity. We are trying to get ourselves on press all the time. We are trying to get media mentions, interviews. And for the past three years, I stayed away from uh, being on any media at all, right? I try to avoid it, right? There's something called overexposure. Publicity doesn't make you money, right? Real sales make you money. So focus on getting customers and sales. Um, and this is very subjective, right? You know what they say about you are who you know, you are who you meet. I think it's total bullshit, right? I think, I think you have to be selective with who you meet, you have to be selective with who you know. Even with your friends, you got to be selective. You don't just make all your friends going out every night. Uh, I'm a very socially awkward introvert. So when I go to events, and I think at some point of time, I really believe that that's the only way they can become the next Facebook. Right? You have to keep meeting people, party with like investors, go to Silicon Valley, you know, hop onto a cafe and just talk to a random stranger. It's incredibly tiring, right? So, uh, not recommended to that. You get more bullshit as well, as an effect. And uh, when we were the B two C business, right? We were we had a dating game. We had a dating app uh, that's kind of gamified. We could have been the next Kinder, actually. Uh, we had the next fantasy football game, and you know we weren't making real money, but we wanted to raise money. So what did we do? We decided to place a lot of logos or partners, right? And uh, today I look at partners. Whenever I look at a website, they say we have these partners. And the question I ask is, what does that even mean? What do you mean a partner? Is that a coffee partner? Is that like a, a business partner? Is that like a you know Tinder partner, right? So we we don't know, right? So what does it really mean? And this is my last and probably most controversial slide, right? I was working about like twelve to eighteen hours a day, right? I think some people would think that's that's too little, but. Uh, I think working hard is also quite hot shit, right? It's not about working hard, it's about working smart. It's about knowing how to manage our time. So these days, right, uh, in game times, we, we have kind of like a 30 to 35 hours work rate, and I find that, hey, we're actually making money, right? Because we are able to focus on the most important things. And uh, with that, that's my final slide. Um, this is one thing that I'm really glad that, you know, fuck up in, right? Spending time with my mom, uh, you know, if in case you're wondering what got me on suicide eventually, um, it wasn't because it was painful, it wasn't because it was just complicated, right? End of the day, anything can change. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your pants, right? But your mom doesn't change, right? Your family doesn't change. So uh, I have my mom to thank for, right, to keep me who I am. She asked me the same question every single day. When are you going to get a real job? Every single day, even today. But I still rather that she ask this question, right, I will miss this question. And, uh, you know, being an Asian mom, you know, it's kind of awkward to give her a hug, to tell her I love her, right? But um, I don't stop giving her a kiss on the head like every week, right? So I hope you enjoy my session, right? Uh, don't fuck up my, what I did like in the past few years. So uh, you have a lovely audience. Thank you so much. So I just want to give a shout out to Candice over there, right? She's a really good friend of mine. She wanted to, she just came back from Nepal. I'm over here. Right, and uh, she's carrying a cookie jar, right, for very good reasons. And uh, I would like to share a little bit about her experience in Nepal, where she's actually working with uh, earthquake victims. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Keith. And also, thank you, Angela, for giving me time to speak in front of you guys. Uh, before I start talking about Nepal, I was asked to talk a little bit about this. For those of you in the back, I don't know if you guys can see, but it's a picture of rubber ducks riding down a canal. Um, basically just going down on this current. And I'm just going to pass it around so people can take a look at that. And I was asked to talk about how I relate to that picture. So, uh, actually when I looked at it, I laughed because it reminds me of an old job I used to have. How many of you guys are scuba divers here? <laughs> cool. How many of you guys uh, have scuba dived in really strong current? There you go. So maybe you'll understand where this is going. Uh, so I used to be a dive master, a scuba diving guide, and one of the challenges I had working with that was one time I was thrown into a situation where they were like, okay, take these two customers and go into this new place you've never been before in super strong current. And I was brand new. I didn't even know how to barely even manage that myself. And my customers were 12-year-old kids that just got certified as well. And so my challenge was basically being confident and being able to take them underwater safely and also go somewhere they've never been, show them around, and go with an ocean current that's just sweeping you through, like the ducks. And so basically, um, 
luckily, kids are the easiest people to fool. So I just turned around like, hey guys, this is going to be a really fun uh, dive because this is my favorite kind of dive. We're going to go drift diving. You know why it's fun? Because you don't have to do anything. It's like a ride. And so basically, I led them to believe that I knew what I was doing and they had a great time and it was a success. And the moral of the story is, is that as long as other people believe in you and you show confidence, then it's going to turn out great. So basically, um, that's my story with the ducks. <laughs> so uh, now I'll start talking about my experience in Nepal. So I was there for five months this year. I was working as a project coordinator for a disaster relief organization. And afterwards I did what I love to do when I went trekking. Nepal is great for trekking. And I ended up finding a valley that was in disaster. I mean, I was working for a disaster relief organization that was getting all sorts of international aid. It was the worst hit area and everything. But these people were in worse condition because they were remote, and so they weren't highly populated, so no one was giving them attention. And so I was going through this area, people were approaching me, villagers, be like, please, um, can you guys stop for tea, or can you stay here the night? And I was like, it's nine in the morning, I have to keep walking. And they're like, on the way back, like, please come by and, and have some business here. And this wasn't the only person, you know, this happened many times as I was on the trail. People were coming up to me, asking for business, and I wasn't, you know, there weren't that many tourists on the trail because it was after the earthquake and all that stuff. So afterwards, I was very moved by what I saw. And I've seen beggars on the street. And I've seen, you know, I've traveled to different places. But this was the most desperation I've ever met in anybody. And so by the time I left, uh, I basically decided I could do something to help. So I started a campaign called Trek Relief, which is basically organizing treks into the region, charity treks, fundraising for the cause, raising awareness, basically. And uh, now I'm just trying to share the word and just let people know that there is an area that needs help. So this is not a story about my fuck up. It's a story about a place that is fucked up. And so I'm basically looking for a solution. And if you want to be a part of that solution and help donate, I'll be around. I'll have a Trek Relief donation star. And if you have any questions, I would love to talk about it more. But uh, we'll save that for the questions afterwards. And thank you so much for your time and listening. Back up for a couple questions. Yeah, is that okay? Re traumatizing. Okay, any audience questions that you want to ask in public? <laughs> can, I, can I just ask, um, as an entrepreneur, right? I mean, definitely you have courage and respect. Firstly, thanks for giving that really insightful, honest speech just now. Yeah. Just wondering, as, a, as an entrepreneur, for you as well, how do you know when to stop trying? Because you definitely have a lot of fuck ups mm. going to where you are right now. Yeah. And I think each fuck up will be even more fucked up. So how do you know when too much fucked up is enough? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very incredible question. I mean, I've never thought about giving up. I never thought about stopping. Uh, but I guess we just kept the same team and we just keep doing new things again and again. So Game Place is actually our like fourth product, right? Uh, we have a dating app, we have a social network, we have a football game, right? But uh, Game Place is a result of the same team doing the same shit, right? Doing a lot of fuck ups. And my only advice for you is get a really good team, get a really good co-founder. Uh, his name is Damon, he's my best friend, I call him my wife as well. <laughs> yeah, he has a real wife. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, he has been my best friend for the past 10 years, and I think as long as you find the right guy, you can still keep fucking up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, what would you say or do if you heard someone was going through a similar situation, perhaps with their, their bank account or con contemplating suicide? Mm -hmm. So I'm not a psychologist by, by training. Uh, someone who is contemplating suicide. Wow. I actually had like personal friends who had uh, committed suicide. I had personal family members. Um, it's really hard to stop anything like that, to be honest. It's really, really difficult, right? Um, 
But I guess what I have to say to them is that, uh, you know, the odds are against you from right from the start, right? Uh, what could end up worse is you don't die, right? You, you can end up paralyzed, you end up, you know, being half dead, like brain dead. Um, I think most importantly, just remember your family, right? Uh, this is a very, you know, this is a very fitting, befitting slide. Uh, I was just thinking about my mom the whole time. She, uh, this is a single mom, right? And I'm a single child. Uh, it's, she's pretty much the only family I have, and, and, you know, as I was doing my research, right, her image just kept floating in my head. So I, I think it's important to think about what you're leaving behind. And I'm always very curious what goes in the head of people who commit suicide as well. Right. Thank you. I have a question. So I, I'm sure a lot of us have been through the same thing. Like you're an entrepreneur, you, you start projects and, and businesses, and then you don't make money. Mm. Uh, have you ever been to a point where you decided that you have to have a job, you know, like because you have responsibilities, you have to pay your bills, you know, support your parents, have a family. So have you ever reached the point where you were like, oh, okay, I need to go find a job now? And I think you obviously haven't found a job. So I mean, what went on through your mind, the reasons why, and how you managed to go on? Yeah, so that question has never like, crossed my mind, like what job am I going to have? I, I, I mean, like, this is still my first job. After like 10 years, uh, I started this while in school, and... Even when you had no money? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's why staying with my mom is great, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the advantage of Singaporean males, right? You know, I, I get teased a lot, I mean, I get, I get, I get laughed a lot by my, my Amor friends. Ah, you're leaving a mom, haha, ha, right? You can't bring girls home, haha, ha, right? But, uh, you know... <laughs> But uh, I think this is a sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice. I mean, when my bank balance was one dollar, right? I was just borrowing money from my mom. She's a factory worker. She's a blue collar worker. But uh, she was always willing to help me out. Um, but I guess the plan B was really at one point in time, the call it ends and and just never crossed my mind, right? The the only other solution is to keep trying until you, you know. Keep faking it until you make it, right? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite friends, right, uh, Hong Ang from Hungry Go Wen, he has this very good like story, right? He was also going broke. He was going for like, he was meeting a lot of friends for lunch because he couldn't afford to buy lunch, right? And and uh, he has this like saying that you know, if you, even you're constipated, if you keep trying out, you can actually the shit will come out, right? So, <laughs> so that. That story resonated in me for a really long time. I, I remember this story for a very really long time. See, it's been like two years, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I guess. But uh, you know, that doesn't apply to everyone, for sure. So I hope that based on my experience that you do not take it wholesale and say, huh, he says I should stop working hard. I shall not work hard anymore, right? It doesn't apply to everybody. I think everyone has a different dynamic. Everyone has a different mom. Everyone, you know, you might have a girlfriend or wife, right? I'm not asking you to like, for divorce right now, right? I, I, I'm single, right? So that's one of the advantage I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, early on in your talk, you mentioned um, a lot of debt that you were in. Mm -hmm. um, have you moved towards resolving that debt? Oh, okay. I'm glad you asked. Like, um, so we were very lucky. We went on to TV. It's called Angel's Gate, right? Uh, it's like the Asian version, Singapore's version of Shark Tank mm -hmm. uh, or Dragon's Den. Uh, reality TV. Don't ever go on the reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, I mean, we spent a lot of days practicing, rehearsing. In the end, we managed to get our 200,000 USD. Like, we won the season, right? And uh, in fact, we felt like we got too much money, we even asked for less, because we just wanted to pay our debt. So, yeah, we were very lucky. We, we met a very good investor, uh, part of the TV program. He said that I'm going to pay off the debts. So I wasted no time, right? You know, I, I don't want to be... I mean, having loans is incredibly stressful, right? It helps that I was a scholar, when right? Back in school, I don't have student loans. But uh, that's not a still not a rational factor, right? So, not everyone's going to go on TV and win money, right? I mean, that's like a, that's like a lottery. But uh, on hindsight, I will not go on a, that kind of situation ever again. So I was very lucky. Um, I'm not sure how anyone else could have done things differently. At one point of time, um, now I remember something. Do um, you guys know what loan sharks are? <laughs> loan sharks? A long year. Basically, illegal money lenders, right? Uh, no, I did not borrow from them, but 
uh, they came to me and asked me to build them a website. And I was really like going to agree. So uh, I remember they were in my office and, and they were just kind of negotiating. You know, they were saying, oh, they only have $2,000, right? <laughs> to build a, a, like a 100 page website. I'm like, you know, we've got a calculator and everything. I'm like, no, 2000 cannot. 2005 can, you know. So we ended up negotiating with a money lender along for the longest time. And I, I think I'm, I'm very lucky that I've got money from the TV instead. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and last one. What, what, for, for you, what would be the reasons why you failed in the first place? Was it like preparation or just you didn't get the right advice? Mm -hmm. So why did I fuck up so much, right? Was that question? Right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I was very naive, right? So remember, I think I, I talked about the first slide. <clears throat> yeah, I was dreaming for a really long time, right? I didn't wake up from that. Um, I was very naive, I was very gullible, and because I was meeting a lot of people, I got a lot more bullshit advice too. And uh, somebody was telling me that, oh, you know what, you should just create a gambling website, right? You, you know, it's gamification, right? And it's the same industry. So we are getting a lot of advice up down left, right? And I just did not work in a startup before. I think that's also a very good reason. I mean, even during my school days, I was an intern in a bank, right? Uh, no offense to bank, right? It's not applicable to a startup, like. So, um, lack of experience, just immaturity, a lot of hard risk, right? Just really, really egoistic, thinking that you're going to be the next master, but no, that's not going really to happen, yeah. So thank you so much for your questions, right? Uh, I'll be hanging around, right? Uh, thank you so much for your time as well. Cheers. Give you a moment to install that and take any mental notes since not too many of you are writing.